It was the year 6 BC. Tiberius Claudius Nero, the son of Livia Drusilla and stepson of Caesar Augustus, could bear no more. He was ready to part ways with Rome. His stepfather's Rome, where the agenda of Augustus had dealt him one crushing blow after another. On the altar of Augustus, he had been forced to sacrifice his marriage to Vipsania, a woman he loved, that he might marry Julia, his stepfather's lusty daughter. And even when that union had briefly fulfilled the wishes of Augustus, bearing him a grandson, it only brought more pain to Tiberius when the child died in infancy. Then, without skipping a beat, the sword of sorrow had pierced him again. Under a cloud of suspicion, his beloved younger brother, Drusus, had died suddenly in Germania. Yet, despite a personal life fraught with disappointment, Tiberius had continued to advance politically. For his role in the annexation of Noricum, and for his successful military campaigns along the Danuvius River, Tiberius had been awarded an ovation in 9 BC. As was expected of his wife and mother, both Julia and Livia Drusilla had performed their social duties, entertaining the wives and daughters of Rome's most important men. However, by 7 BC, when Tiberius was awarded a second ovation for victories in Germania, which he had achieved after replacing his late brother, only his mother did the entertaining. Julia was nowhere to be found. Something had caused this unpredictable wife of Tiberius to re-evaluate her social priorities. Julia had turned her sights to a new social group. This fresh coterie was made up of her mother, Scribonius Cornelian and Sempronian relatives, and also attracted members of the Emilii and the Quinctii families, who had been sidelined by the rise of Caesar Augustus but it was the inclusion of Appius Claudius Bulker that made the new clique immediately popular with the city plebs, whose symbolic benefactors were the deceased grandparents of Claudius Bulker, Fulvia Flaccabambula and Publius Clodius, Rome's most historically controversial tribune of the plebs. But Tiberius stood staunchly on the other side of that controversy. Serving as consul for the 8 BC year, his first day in office brought a clear political statement of his preference for the rule of the senatorial elite over that of the populists. By calling for the restoration and reconstruction of Rome's Temple of Concord, he had aligned himself with the consul Pimius, who had restored the temple some 113 years earlier, after sacrificing the populists of his day to the goddess. In 121 BC, at the behest of Epimius, Gaius Gracchus, Fulvius Flaccus, and hundreds of others were massacred before Concord's temple was rebuilt in thanksgiving for the return to senatorial supremacy. In Tiberius, also, beat the heart of an oligarch. Not long after Tiberius restored the temple of Concord, the city's populist factions launched a campaign to remove him as the protector of Julia's sons. Sycophantic letters were written to Caesar Augustus insisting Julia be allowed to divorce Tiberius and marry a man deserving of the consummate name of Caesar. After all, these letters argued, apart from Tiberius and his late brother Drusus, whose consulships were but magnanimous gifts from Augustus himself. No Claudius Nero had been found worthy to hold the Fasces in over 200 years. But far from being swayed by the opinion of the people, Tiberius's stepfather instead doubled down. For the 6 BC year, Caesar Augustus simpelled the Senate to grant Tiberius the Tribunicia Potestus for a lustrum, a period of five years. The tribunician powers were those previously held by Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, naming Tiberius an equal partner with Augustus in the governing of the empire. But those who wished to see Tiberius removed from power could also double down. And they did. During the elections for the six BC consulships, 
This contingent elected a 14-year-old boy to the highest office in the land, though he still wore a child's bola pendant around his neck for protection from evil spirits, and had not yet donned his adult toga. The primary heir of Augustus was elected senior consul, the heir he had forcibly adopted from his daughter Julia and the deceased but cherished Marcus Agrippa whom Augustus now sought to exchange for Tiberius in the public's affections. Yet the public failed to cooperate, giving Augustus only flattery by choosing his inexperienced grandson over a Claudian man with military, political, and diplomatic experience. But Caesar Augustus was not flattered. The father of the nation was now displeased, dismayed, and strangely uneasy. He not only chastised and rebuked the Roman people for what they had done, he criticized the actions of his grandsons as well. From the rostra, Caesar Augustus prayed, Never again should such circumstances arise, as happened to me, that a consul should be elected before the age of twenty. Like willful children, the Roman people insisted that Caesar Augustus let the election stand, one should not be consul, replied Augustus, eyes turning towards his petulant grandsons, until one can avoid error himself, and resist the impulses of the populace. Resist the impulses of the populace. Augustus had spoken volumes. It was in the impulses of the populace, and not in the mind of a fourteen-year-old where the idea of running for the consulship had originated. And, in case any adult Roman mind needed confirmation, that Gaius had even attended the elections had satisfied a necessary prerequisite for winning. But to the eleven-year-old brother of Gaius, it must have seemed that challenging authority had been given the green light, as Lucius had been caught entering a theatre without an adult escort, an indication the young boy was sneaking out of the home. It might have surprised both Gaius and Lucius, but even the authority of Caesar Augustus had boundaries. Although he could recommend which candidates should stand for elections, he did not have the power to outright refuse the will of the people. And so, in response to the election of the 14-year-old Gaius Caesar in 6 BC, the stepfather of Tiberius struck a compromise. Caesar Augustus allowed the election to stand, but officially postponed Gaius taking active possession of the office until he reached the age of twenty, at which time he could fulfill his elected role as consul of Rome. But Tiberius had gotten the message loud and clear. All the messages. Not only had the public indicated its preference for Caesar's heir, but it also seemed as if Caesar Augustus had granted the Tribune Potestus to Tiberius as a means of punishing his disobedient grandsons. With his wife Julia working against him, and his stepfather invested only in the careers and reputations of Gaius and Lucius, Tiberius came to understand that he would never share the kind of equal partnership with Caesar Augustus which Marcus Agrippa had once enjoyed. Tiberius was a placeholder, a glorified babysitter meant to fill the void should Caesar Augustus die before Gaius and Lucius were mature enough to take the reins of government. And with that, Tiberius made the decision to withdraw from public life and to leave Rome. He formally requested permission to pursue his philosophical and literary interests on the island of Rhodes the same island where Julius Caesar and Marcus Dullius Cicero had received such extensive educations. But Caesar Augustus refused Tiberius the right to leave. Augustus needed Tiberius in Armenia, where he meant for him to take up command of the East. But Tiberius was resolute and would not be swayed. Why should Tiberius continue to play Augustus's game of succession when in the end he would be swept aside in favor of Gaius and Lucius, and have no legacy to bequeath to his own son, Drusus? And Julia, his wife, amidst whispers of affairs and inappropriate drinking parties, had deliberately sabotaged him through her maternal family, without a word from her father. 
apart from nonchalant jokes about her naughty behavior. But worst of all for Tiberius was witnessing the woman he loved, Vipsania Agrippina, pregnant again with her new husband's fifth child. Enough was enough. It had to end. And so, Tiberius stopped eating. For days he refused to take any nourishment. Finally, on the fourth day of his hunger strike, and likely in response to the tearful pleas of his wife Livia, on behalf of her despondent son, Augustus relented. He gave Tiberius permission to go to Rhodes and study, but Augustus was not happy about it. In the Forum Romanum, within the Senate, and most assuredly into the ears of a desperate and fearful mother, Augustus raged over the desertion of the ungrateful Tiberius Claudius Nero. Tiberius, however, did not care. He departed Rome at once and booked passage on a ship from the port of Ostia. But, just as his ship was about to launch, an urgent message reached him from Rome. Caesar Augustus had fallen deathly ill. Once again, the father of the nation appeared to be at death's door. Tiberius delayed his ship's launch, but did not return to Rome. Instead, he waited. Eventually, Tiberius, who remained on board his moored ship, received the news that Caesar Augustus had recovered. Tiberius made ready to depart. But, before he sailed out of the harbor, Tiberius dispatched a statue of Hestia, or Vesta, the goddess of the half with whom his mother Livia was closely associated, to the Temple of Concord. This statue, erected in the temple, was a subtle reminder to his mother, Livia Drusilla, not to abandon her son. Then, he ordered the anchors of his ship pulled up, and Tiberius sailed out of Ostia, and into self-imposed exile.